Hey everyone, welcome to Regen Med Global, the podcast, where we bring you the newest breakthroughs in medicine and research to help bring hope in fighting incurable diseases. My name is Shia. Today, we're here to discuss a potential treatment for Parkinson's disease for which the phase one clinical trial results have been released. Involved in the study, we have Dr. Claire Henchcliffe, Professor and Chair of Neurology at UC Irvine School of Medicine. Dr. Henchcliffe, thank you for taking the time to go ahead and connect. Um, aside from uh, my, my chair responsibilities, my real passion in my career has been to work with people with Parkinson's disease. And um, as you probably know, there's, uh, you know, Parkinson's is a progressive disorder that um, primarily what you see, the Parkinson's you see is, is to do with movement. People um, suffer from incoordination and, and slowing and they can get muscle stiffness and um, the balance suffers. Um, and then there's, there's a whole host of, of symptoms which we call the Parkinson's you don't see. So sometimes people get uh, mood changes or pain. There are a whole host of, of symptoms that go with this. And as you probably know, there, there's absolutely no cure yet for Parkinson's disease. So for more than 25 years, I've been working not only in the clinic with, with my own patients, but also on um, research to try to advance our understanding um, to help with diagnosis. And, and um, this phase one trial uh, that you mentioned is really looking at a very new way of um, potentially alleviating the movement symptoms that people get. Wow, that's awesome, Dr. Hanchcliffe. I mean, kind of going straight into the the treatment, can you tell us a little bit about what this new potential kind of treatment is and what it's called? So, um, yeah, this uh, this product is um, called Bemdana Pro Cell. Um, it's a cell-based product. These are um, the cells themselves that get uh, delivered during surgery as um, a potential treatment are actually progenitors, kind of juvenile versions of mature um, dopamine producing nerve, neuro, um, nerve cells or neurons. Um, they are developed in the laboratory. They're kind of coaxed um, to follow a differentiation pathway um, to develop, to become these dopamine producing cells from the original cells that are actually human stem cells that have been grown in the laboratory. Um, so it gives you the ability for the first time to grow these um, cells in unlimited quantities and to do really extensive testing to make sure that you understand what they're, what they're capable of before they ever are going to be transplanted into human beings. Um, the cells, as I mentioned, they're surgically delivered. They're delivered to a part of the brain called the putamen. Um, and that's where in Parkinson's disease, dopamine inputs are lost. So these, this loss of the dopamine input is really what's responsible for the vast majority of the movement symptoms that we see in Parkinson's disease. So the idea is that restoring those dopamine inputs in a very physiologic, very kind of natural way using cells rather than oral medications is going to help the movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease. With these phase one clinical trials, can you give us a little bit about kind of what the, uh, just like a brief overview of those results? Absolutely. Um, and bearing in mind, you know, this is the first time this has been done in human beings. So although we have really extensive testing in animal models of Parkinson's disease um, that uh, showed that the, the cells could be safely transplanted didn't cause a lot of side effects and were very efficacious in animal models. It's the first time in humans. So in a, any phase one trial, the focus is always on safety and tolerability. And um, that was the primary endpoint. So in a small number of patients with Parkinson's disease, where the symptoms were inadequately controlled with medications, we could show that not only was the surgery feasible, everyone got the full dose of cells, um, but also we met our safety and tolerability endpoints, um, meaning that uh, the, um, if, if I could share just a few more details, um, there were only two serious adverse events 
Um, a serious adverse event in one case was likely related to the surgery. It was a single seizure that was not repeated. Um, and the other serious adverse event was a COVID infection. Um, so I think that's really remarkable because bear in mind that through the period that we've been following people, um, they had had the cells surgically delivered. The cells are not immunologically matched. So we then proceeded with a year of immunosuppression and that went through the COVID pandemic. So I think it's absolutely remarkable that we um, didn't, uh, you know, that, that people did so well. Did your team also take any input in terms of the type of improvements with symptoms? Absolutely. Um, yes. So the, the primary endpoint, of course, was safety and tolerability, but we had a number of secondary and exploratory endpoints that we followed in the clinical trial to try to understand and try to learn what more these cells can do and how they behave. We know that in animal models, the cells, once they're transplanted, they survive, they connect with the host neurons, they talk to the neurons, they release dopamine and they um, help to ameliorate uh, uh, the, the physical um, aspects of Parkinson's in these animal models. Um, in people, um, a couple of uh, in really um, results that, that gave us cause for optimism. The first was looking at a biomarker. It's called um, a, a pet, it's a fluorodopa PET scan. Um, it picks up cells that are producing dopamine um, and uh, we could actually see increases um, on average in our um, patients who'd received the cells in the area where the transplanted cells were surgically delivered. So I think it gives us cause for optimism that the cells, once they're delivered, they're surviving. So that's step one. The second part is what are they actually doing? And um, we, we found a number of people in the trial out of the um, 12 who received transplants who actually had some improvements in their Parkinson's um, symptoms. So including um, the amount of, of time that uh, they were able to control their symptoms during the day and then um, the uh, some relief of the Parkinson's symptoms themselves. I just want to say that we have to be really cautious about how we interpret that because this was a, a study, it was a clinical trial specifically designed to look at safety and tolerability. So with 12 people, you, you can't go ahead and say, well, here's our evidence of efficacy. We didn't have a sham control. There was no placebo. And so in theory, what we're seeing could be a placebo response as well. Um, so time will tell, you know, we, we want to see these benefits um, be sustained. And of course, the next step is to move ahead and perform testing in a controlled way, which is going to allow us to not only um, collect more data um, for safety and tolerability, but also look more formally at those potential benefits from, from the cells. And so that's the aim um, of uh, Blue Rock Therapeutics who've been supporting this study um, to go on and take that next step, which is really exciting. How this treatment is administered. I know you shared with us it's in, uh, injected into the putamen, is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So. Um, yeah, it, it needs um, a surgical delivery. So essentially the patients okay. um, are uh, in the operating room um, with general anesthesia. Um, there's a, a, a small burr hole that needs to be made on both sides in the same surgical um, session and using really meticulous planning um, and uh, MRI guidance, um, the cells can be delivered uh, deep into the brain um, preci very precisely into the posterior part of the putamen where more of the, in the dopamine inputs have been lost in those patients. Um, then um, it's, it's a, a, an overnight stay. Um, it's a very quick recovery. Um, the people who undergo this, as I mentioned, they then receive um, Im an immunosuppression uh, regimen of drugs for a year to enhance um, the uh, chances that the cells are, are going to be able to survive and integrate and function. 
Is this uh, like a one-time type of treatment or is this something that's reoccurring where if someone receives this treatment, it's going to be every so often? Um, the aim is to produce a one-time, a one uh, lifetime um, uh, treatment for benefit of Parkinson's through the entire lifespan. That's the aim. Um, okay. No need for... Uh, reprogramming, no need for additional surgeries, exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about what when phase two will begin of the clinical trials and how that's going to look like? For the phase two, um, I, I am very hopeful that we're going to see phase two launch next year. Do you have any details as to how they would potentially be measuring success or benefits in the phase two trial? Um, in our trials um, in Parkinson's disease, we really benefit from an extremely rich experience of previous attempts at transplant, but also from um, other surgical options like deep brain stimulation. And so um, we're, we're lucky in that the endpoints that we um, have available as options have been extremely well studied. So this can be um, when people uh, when people's symptoms are not well controlled by their oral medications, we can divide up their days into what we call on time when the symptoms are controlled and off time when the symptoms are not well controlled. And so one really great endpoint to follow is um, amount of off time and seeing a reduction so that people's days are smoother, they have less downtime. Um, that really uh, helps our, our patients live their, their lives, which is what this is all about. Um, the second type of endpoint that can be um, uh, followed is also uh, for uh, neurological benefit. When, they, when people are off their medications, we can measure the potential um, benefit of a product, whether it's bemdanoprocel or whether it's an oral medication, by seeing the improvement they have when they're off their other medications. Um, but of course, we follow all sorts of symptoms, and, and so other endpoints are going to be um, following uh, uh, mood, um, quality of life, uh, sleep. A lot of a lot of the Parkinson's that again, it's part of the Parkinson's that you you don't see. Um, and in terms of actually being able to uh, visualize the cells, there are a number of different windows on the brain that are available. So in the phase one trial, um, we used the uh, fluorodopa PET scan, but there are other markers that could be used there as well. And then of course, um, there's also a, a number of um, apps and devices that are available for remote monitoring. And I think that's something really interesting because traditionally when we, um, traditionally when we measure the effects of therapeutics, experimental therapeutics, we're seeing people in the office and that's not how people are in, in the wild, right? Um, so we really want to be able to measure what these um, interventions can do and what benefits they can lead to uh, as people are out and about living their everyday, you know, living their lives and doing what they need to do every day. You know how soon something like this could be potentially widely available for patients? Um, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the research um, since the phase one started, it's gone very quickly, very efficiently, and we have Blue Rock uh, Therapeutics to, to thank for really um, pushing that along. Um, nevertheless, it's going to be a few years before this could um, reach the point where there's enough data uh, to support its approval. Um, so we're in this for the long term. Could this treatment potentially be utilized for any other diseases or open up research for any other diseases? Um, that's an absolutely great question. I think, um, you know, that there, there are so many disorders like Parkinson's where there's no cure. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not that this is a magic bullet for Parkinson's, there's still a lot of aspects of Parkinson's that, that this um, treatment will will not help. Um, if, it's, if it's not dopamine related, maybe this is not going to be helpful. So um, I think for these uh, specific cells, um, there are some other disorders that are, are dopamine 
based um, where it might be possible to investigate their use. But unfortunately, those disorders have a lot of, I'm thinking about things like multiple system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy. But unfortunately, a lot of the disability that comes with those is not dopamine related. So I think for, for me, um, one of the real strengths of this field um, is that the stem cells that I mentioned before, they can be coaxed in the laboratory not only to become dopamine neurons or progenitors, but they can be coaxed along any one of a number of other pathways. You can get these cells to look like cortical neurons. You, you can get them to look like, uh, you know, there, there, there are people who are um, working to develop microglia from stem cells, so all sorts of different cells. And I think that really just opens up um, the, the whole field to look at other disorders, including rare disorders where it might be a very specific type of um, uh, location or, or, or cell type that's needed, but also including some, um, uh, you know, very common disorders, including other neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. Any other final thoughts that you'd like to go ahead and add? Um, I think one of the amazing rewards in terms of doing this type of research for all of us, for the entire team, is to have the privilege of um, meeting patients with Parkinson's who want to jump in, want to get involved, want to contribute to the next generation of therapeutics. Um, these are, are people who are amazingly dedicated. Without patients who do this, we're going nowhere with our research, right? So I think um, I'm eternally thankful um, to the people who partner with us, team up with us, and um, you know, spend time, energy, um, and uh, give us their, their, their feedback and their input. I'm extremely grateful to the people with Parkinson's and their loved ones who help us to move things ahead. Dr. Henchcliffe, thank you so much for your time. Very grateful. And thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you um, for everything you're doing to get the word out.